Muy buenos días, Sir Derek Barton, rectora del Colegio Universitario de Calle, decanos, invitados especiales, claustro de este colegio, estudiantes, comunidad universitaria en general. Hoy nos reúne una de las actividades más importantes del año académico. Es la lección magistral mediante la cual celebramos la excelencia en la universidad. La lección magistral ha sido instaurada mediante una decisión de la Junta Académica de este colegio en su certificación número 32 de 1986-87, amparada en las prerrogativas que le concede el Reglamento General de la Universidad de Puerto Rico para otorgar reconocimientos académicos. Dice así. El Colegio Universitario de Calley debiera inaugurar anualmente su curso con un acto académico en el que se reúnan en un lugar propicio el estudiantado y la facultad, cuerpos que de forma eminente componen nuestra comunidad de estudio. Este acto servirá para reconfirmar nuestra pertenencia a la mejor tradición universitaria de la que formamos parte continua, siéndole fiel a los ideales que la definen en su ley, tales como la transmisión e incremento del saber, el cultivo del amor al conocimiento como vía de libertad, a través de la búsqueda y discusión de la verdad y el conservar, enriquecer y difundir los valores culturales del pueblo puertorriqueño. Para lograr lo anterior, la Junta Académica del Colegio Universitario de Calley extenderá anualmente una invitación formal a una figura prominente del país o del exterior, sin excluir a profesores de la institución que hayan hecho aportaciones significativas al ambiente cultural puertorriqueño o internacional en alguna de las disciplinas comprendidas en las artes, las ciencias naturales, sociales, la educación, la historia, la literatura y el pensamiento. Esta tendrá a su cargo la responsabilidad de ofrecer una conferencia o lección magistral al Pleno de la Comunidad Estudiosa y a las figuras académicas y públicas que se considerara pertinente invitar. La Junta Académica podrá honrar a cualquier profesor distinguido ofreciéndole la oportunidad de dictar una conferencia sobre un tema que el profesor determine y en tal ocasión se le investirá con esta alta dignidad institucional honorífica. Mediante esta primera lección magistral dedicada a las ciencias, también reconocemos los logros y la excelencia de nuestros departamentos de ciencia. Con ustedes, la profesora Rosita Feliu. Doctor Derek Barton, invitado especial del Colegio Universitario de Calle, doctora Margarita Benítez, rectora, decanos, facultad, invitados especiales, eh, facultad de estudiantes, invitados todos. Me corresponde en el día de hoy representar al Colegio de Químicos de Puerto Rico, ya que sus oficiales se encuentran participando activamente como anfitriones del segundo Congreso Panamericano de Química que se celebra conjuntamente con la Convención de Ciencias Forenses y Energex 91. Este evento eh, se inauguró anoche y se lleva a cabo en San Juan. Nos visitan durante esta semana en Puerto Rico prominentes científicos de todas partes, especialmente de Norte, Centro y Suramérica. Con motivo de este congreso, nos honra con su presencia el doctor Barton, a quien le damos una calurosa bienvenida a nuestra isla de Puerto Rico y a nuestro recinto de Calle. A nombre del Colegio de Químicos de Puerto Rico, les extiendo un cordial saludo a toda la comunidad académica de Calle. Eh, hemos trabajado en colaboración anteriormente, en el transcurso de los últimos años, y hoy una vez más nos honramos tra en trabajar juntos, tratando de elaborar por unos mejores profesionales para un mejor Puerto Rico. Gracias. Me corresponde presentar a la doctora Margarita, nuestra rectora.
Mr. Derek Barton, señores miembros de la Junta Académica, distinguidos invitados de la Comunidad Académica de Puerto Rico y del Colegio de Químicos, señores claustrales, estudiantes y personal de apoyo del Colegio Universitario de Calley, amigos todos de la Universidad de Puerto Rico, gracias por acudir a esta convocatoria académica. Esta casa universitaria se honra y se regocija al recibir hoy a un ilustre estudioso, investigador y teórico de las ciencias naturales, cuyas aportaciones al campo de la química orgánica han merecido reconocimientos internacionales del más alto calibre, entre ellos el Premio Nobel de Química de 1969. En ese mismo año, 1969, esta comunidad universitaria se convirtió en colegio de cuatro años y se formularon programas de estudios en las artes y ciencias que reconocían la significación de integrar componentes de investigación al quehacer docente para propiciar la cabal comprensión de las maravillas del mundo natural y para inculcar en nuestras juventudes el rigor y el júbilo de la labor científica. Soñamos entonces con traer a Calley a sabios y estudiosos de diversos lugares y varias disciplinas para enriquecernos con su pensamiento, aprendiendo de ellos, con ellos y por ellos, compartiendo su búsqueda y su creación de conocimientos. La presencia entre nosotros hoy de Sir Derek Barton es una manifestación de la realización de nuestro sueño. Es también un estímulo y un reconocimiento a nuestra joven comunidad científica que tantas satisfacciones y tantas esperanzas ha representado para sus mayores. En deferencia a nuestro distinguido invitado, continuaré su presentación en su lengua materna, que es lengua universal de la comunidad científica del siglo XX. Sir Derek, our pride in your presence today is based on your many extraordinary ac accomplishments, as well as in the hope and the possibilities that you represent to our students and teachers. A textbook brought to life, a theory incarnate, is among us today. We are both humbled and honored by your shining example. You have rethought our world, redefining relations among its fundamentals. You have received the legacy of scientists before you and enhanced and enriched it by your own contribution. This is the dream of teachers, that their students one day will surpass their own teachings, thus fulfilling the hope and the moral command of the biblical parable of the talents. I said earlier that the year you were awarded the Nobel Prize for Chemistry was the year that our school became a four-year college, and we began to dream about making research among students and faculty an integral part of our academic programs. 22 years later, we are closer to that dream, which is brought to life by your presence among us. May I venture the hope that our budding researchers, our own young science students that have made us so proud by their collegiate accomplishments here in the United States, will one day also contribute to scientific knowledge and to scientific theory And remember this day as the first day they heard how to win a Nobel Prize. I know they will remember, as all of us here will, September 24, 1991, your master class as a threshold and milestone of our university experience. Sir Derek Barton. First of all, I would like to thank you for your splendid introduction. And I thank also the university for providing a choir. It is the first time in my life that I have been introduced by a choir. 
I have had an orchestra before, but never a choir. <laughs> the talk that I'm going to give today can be understood by people who have no knowledge of chemistry. However, it does help a little if you know something about uh, a chemical formula. We will do our best. Chemistry is made up of molecules. All the molecules of a given substance are the same, and they have each one a structure. And when the chemist begins to, to work on chemistry, he has to determine the structures of his molecules. This has taken us uh, well over 150 years, but nevertheless we have today reached a very high level of sophistication in the determination of molecular structure. I will try to produce the first slide. Yes. Now we have to turn out the lights. Any more? That's good. Now, if I had the pointer, preferably the laser pointer, any pointer? Can we produce a pointer? Maybe. Maybe. Well, anyway, let's start by looking at this slide. And you see I've written molecular structure at the top. What, what, can, well, what does a molecular structure consist? First of all, we have to determine the molecular formula. That is to say, what atoms are present in the molecule and how many of each kind. Then we have to determine the constitution of the molecule. That is, which atoms are bonded to which. That's a concept that comes to us from about 100 years ago, uh, first proposed by Kekulé. And when we've got the constitution, we have to worry about the configuration, something that comes to us from the thoughts of Van Hoff and Nobel also in the last century. We recognize in a molecule certain points of asymmetry, or chirality, as it is called. And <clears throat> when we have recognized these points of chirality, we can predict how many isomers there will be of a given uh, constitution. It will be 2 to the n, n, where n is the number of centers of asymmetry or points of chirality. Now, that was done, as I said, in the last century. And then there was a pause in the theory of chemistry, particularly organic chemistry. We had, of course, uh, fundamental things like molecular orbital theory, which explain everything, but which do not lend themselves very much to uh, chemical reactions. And uh, we came to confirmation. What is a confirmation of a molecule? A confirmation of a molecule is the shape of the molecule, how it is in three dimensions. Most molecules have an infinite number of possible confirmations, and therefore the term would have no value were it not for the fact that there is usually a preferred confirmation. And when you have selected your preferred conformation, your preferred shape for the molecule, you can analyze its physical and chemical properties in terms of the shape. And the Nobel Prize that I was fortunate enough to, earn, to, to win in 1969 came from a short article which I wrote about the conformation of organic molecules, how you could select a preferred conformation and then interpret the chemistry in terms of that confirmation. That happened in 1950, and you will be quite surprised to think that between Van Hoff and Lebel, which was at the end of the last century, and the next step forward, we had to wait 60 years. But that is the way that chemists think, or rather do not think, because the, the, the hypothesis that I put forward could have been presented 20 years earlier, but it wasn't. <clears throat> now we really do want our pointer. On the top left-hand side, 
you see the formula of the simple molecule cyclohexane. Now, cyclohexane has played always a leading role in conformational discussions. Underneath, in two, you will see one conformation for cyclohexane. It is, in fact, the preferred conformation. And next to it, number three, is uh, the, a non-preferred conformation. The one on the left, two, is called a chair conformation because it looks like a chair. And the one on the right is called the boat conformation because it looks like a boat. Now, we now know quite clearly which is preferred. It is the chair conformation, the one that you see on the left. And the one which is of next higher energy is, in fact, the so-called twist boat conformation, which is over there on the right-hand side. <clears throat> now, underneath, I have drawn two other drawings. One of them is called axial, and the other one is called equatorial. The axial bonds in cyclohexane are parallel to the threefold axis of rotation of the molecule, uh, and the equatorial bonds, no, I'm afraid that won't do. It has to, I have to point it, and it must be a light pointer. Sorry. It, it, you asked me yesterday, what did I need for this talk? And I said, a blackboard. I've got the blackboard all right, but I did never thought to ask for a pointer because I thought there would be one automatically. <laughs> Sorry, my fault. So let's, let's struggle on. And those people who want to leave, they're, well, they can leave, I don't mind. Those people who don't know any chemistry and who don't find this entertaining, please leave. So at the bottom you find, as I said, one drawing, six, which is called axial, and it depicts the six axial bonds that there are in the chair form of, of cyclohexane. And the other six are in an equatorial belt around the molecule. You see them in seven on the right-hand side. And these two kinds of bonds are, of course, geometrically distinct, because one is one sort of parallel to the axis of symmetry and the others an in equatorial belt. But if we take six and we pull one end down and push the other end up, that is called ring flipping, we will convert all the axial bonds into equatorial bonds and vice versa. Now you will see why I mention this in a later slide. At the very top of this slide, formulae 4 and 5, you will see that uh, I have written cis and trans. And that is with respect to substitution in the cyclohexane ring. If we number the carbons 1, 2, 3, 4, etc., the 1, 4 cis isomer is that which has the two substituents on the same side of the molecule. And the one on the right-hand side, 5, which has the 1,4 substituents trans to each other, that's a distinctly different substance. You cannot superimpose 4 on 5. They have completely different chemical and physical properties. Now, we will see. Yes, here are some more uh, conformational drawings. And on the top, I have two representations of cis, that is to say, uh, the one on the left has, thank you, one on the left has one X bond equatorial and the other one axial. And if we undergo ring flipping, we will turn it into the one cis on the right and we will see we still have one equatorial bond and one axial bond. And so if we pick up the formula on the right, turn it round 180 degrees and we can put it down and superimpose it on the other one. So that means that they, it's, there is no change. It's the same structure. On the other hand, if we look at the trans-oriented molecule, which has two equatorial bonds, and we ring flip it, we will see it turns into something else which is still trans. It has, it's the same substance, but it has two axial bonds. And so we can ask the question, does the molecule prefer to be 
on the left-hand side in that confirmation, or does it prefer to be on the right-hand side in the other confirmation? And we will see how we discuss and determine this as we go along. Now, I shared the Nobel Prize in 1969 with Professor Hassel, Professor Odd Hassel from Norway. He came from a wealthy family of ship owners, and so his lifestyle was as he pleased to make it. He and I shared the prize for the development of the concept of confirmation. And you see that Hassel was born in the last century and that he died in 1981. He was a student at the University of Oslo between 1915 and 1920. Then, from 1920 to 1922, as befitted his, his station in life, he spent two years making the grand tour of Europe, and he visited France and Germany and Italy not England. He decided to do his graduate work in Germany and he went in 1922 first to work with a professor called Fayans who later emigrated to the United States to Michigan and then he changed, he had one publication with Fayans and then he changed to work with Hermann Mark and Hermann Mark is, became he was an X-ray crystallographer to begin with, but then he became an expert on polymers. He's still alive today, 95 years old, still goes to the lab every day. Uh, this is frequently the case with chemists. They live to very older ages, particularly if they're academic chemists. Now, um, when... Yes, Hassel had four publications with... with uh, uh, with Mark. And you see that he had five publications in two years. By modern standards, that would be described as rather over-publishing. Uh, anyway, 1925, he went back to Oslo, and he was appointed as an assistant professor. He became a full professor in 1934, and in the European system, of course, there is only one full professor, and that was the position that he occupied until he retired in 1964. Now, what did he work on? He had been trained by Mark as an X-ray crystallographer, but he couldn't get any X-ray crystallographic equipment, wasn't commercially available, and so he did uh, something which was within his means. He determined dipole moments. Uh, you don't hear very much of dipole moments these days, but it was a popular technique in the 1920s. It didn't have a very good reputation for accuracy, and neither did the second subject that he turned to later on in the 1930s, which was electron diffraction. In dipole moments, if the dipole moments were determined by a physical chemist, it was nearly always on something he took out of a bottle and uh, therefore it would be only as good a dipole moment as the purity of what was in the bottle, which was, was of course, variable. Uh, if, you, if it was an organic chemist, he probably took a lot of trouble to purify his compound, but he probably was rather uh, I incapable of making an accurate physical determination. So in both cases, both groups of chemists uh, made mistakes with their dipole moments. And in fact, even into the 1950s, there was one well-known organic chemist who was always saying that he had measured naphthalene and found that it had a, had a strong dipole moment. The, chem the chemists will know that that is nonsense. So, <clears throat> I would just draw your attention to one publication from this period, from Hassel, in the year 1939, and published in the JACS, he had taken 1,4-dihydrobenzene and added bromine to it. This gives you a beautifully crystalline tetrabromide. And the tetrabromide that you get corresponds in configuration to what would be predicted by a chemist who was thinking about this problem today. But, of course, Hassel didn't know that. He had to do it the hard way. So he determined his dipole moments. He did his electron diffraction, which was a 
a rather uh, subjective technique at that time because you had to look at, compare the darkness of spots. So he did that and then he went to California and I presume he visited Pauling, though he doesn't say so, and he did some X-ray diffraction work. And from all these measurements, each one agreed that the structure, molecular structure, of this tetrabromide was as written there. You see on the right-hand side the planar formula and the conformational drawing is on the left-hand side. It is, of course, a chair. Now, we will come back to this 1939 paper later on, but first of all, I would like to show you what Hassel wrote in this preliminary communication to the JACS. He wrote, although these investigations have not been brought as far as we could have wished in the case of the X-ray crystallographic part, we should not like to delay publication much longer and are therefore publishing our results now in preliminary form. And of course, that is a well-known formula for saying that you're not going to publish a full paper. <laughs> and he didn't. Nothing more appeared about this in the literature, although in my opinion it was, a, it was a leading and most important publication. Everybody ignored it. Now, in 1943, of course when he returned to Europe in 1939, the war began and in 1940 uh, Norway was invaded by the Nazis. Uh, Hassel ended up in a concentration camp for the last two years of the war. But before he got to that stage, he did write a review article, which was published in an obscure Norwegian journal in Norwegian. And nobody else ever read this article. But he summarized what he had found over the last 12 years. He said that he had looked at cyclohexyl chloride, which is the top formula, and the chlorine prefers to be equatorial rather than axial, that he had looked at various 1-2 trans dihalides, and they always preferred to have the two substituents equatorial rather than axial, that he had looked at 1-4 disubstituted cyclohexanes, that's the third one down, and had shown that the diequatorial was always preferred to the diaxial on the right, and he said that in the 1-3 case, it was different. There, the cis-1-3 compound had two equatorial bonds, not two axial bonds on the right-hand side, and he considered that 1-3 diaxial interactions probably could not exist. The molecule would be too unstable and would revert immediately to something else, a different conformation. Now, he got one thing not quite right. He said that uh, cyclohexane 1,4-dione, if it were a chair, would have no dipole moment. He found a dipole moment. He accounted for it by supposing that the cyclohexane 1,4-dione was enolized. But, of course, if he had talked to some organic chemistry colleagues, he would have known that that was not true. In fact, the cyclohexane one four dione contains about 20% of the boat conformation in equilibrium with the chair conformation. And that occurs because of the presence of two trigonal carbonyls in the, in the molecule. We will come back to that later on. So I talked about how he spent time in a concentration camp. And when he got out, he went to work with a student called Bastionson, who later became the professor and succeeded Hassel. And Bastian and Hassel built a bigger and better electron diffraction apparatus and proceeded to examine again saturated hydrocarbons. And they took the decalins this time, uh, transdecalin and cisdecalin. Now, all the organic chemists who read the textbooks knew at that time that transdecalin probably had a two-chair conformation because that's the way it had been drawn in the textbooks. And they thought that cisdecalin had a two-boat conformation because that's also the way it had been drawn in the textbooks. And Hassel showed that that was wrong because he found from electron diffraction measurements that cisdecalin really was a two-chair molecule, a different conformation with two chairs in it. And I thought that was very, very interesting. 
Um, the original hypothesis about two boats had come from a paper by a German chemist, Moore, which I will return to later. Well, what else did Hassel do in his life? In 1947, he published a nice paper in the Acta Chemica Scandinavica showing that uh, in sugars, the chair conformation was also preferred and that there was an anomeric effect, the first recognition of that. And then, in 1950, he finally got enough money to buy himself an X-ray diffraction apparatus, and then he changed his subject. Instead of doing this conformational kind of work for which he eventually uh, shared the Nobel Prize, he turned to looking at charge transfer complexes between halogens and uh, ethers in the crystal. And although I'm sure that was very good work, it had no significant effect on chemistry. Now, there's a history of conformational analysis. I haven't told you about the earlier history, and I'd like to do this now. Uh, there's a book about it uh, by a man called Ramsey, and it's, it begins in 1890, in the last century, when a man called Saxer, who I think was a postdoc, I don't think he even was on the staff anywhere, wrote a short paper which was published in Chemische Berichte. And it, Saxer said, well, if we respect the valence angles of the tetrahedron, uh, cyclohexane can exist in two forms, a chair form and a boat form, and therefore there will be two cyclohexanes which we can separate. Now, he also pointed out that that would mean that the number of isomers of, say, a monosubstituted cyclohexane would be much greater than thought before, there would be four of them, and for the disubstituted ones it would be even more complicated. Now, this was not accepted by anyone for two reasons. First of all, no one could ever separate cyclohexane into two forms, and no one could did, did isolate the numbers of isomers that uh, Saxer was predicting. Moreover, the great German chemist of the day, uh, <coughs> von Bayer, had pointed out that cyclohexane rings were going to be flat. That was his that was his contribution. Every, he said every, all the rings are going to be flat. Four, five, six, seven, they're all be going to be flat rings. And people believed that because von Bayer was a very great synthetic chemist who had just synthesized indigo and had, had transformed the world's chemical industry. Well, nothing else happened until 1918. And this is the paper by Moore, who was a respectable uh, professor of chemistry. Uh, also in the Berichter, and Saxer and Moore was looking at the decalins, and he said, well, one buyer can't be right, because to make decalin flat would, would involve an enormous amount of angle strain, and therefore there must be two decalins, a trans one and a cis one, which of course is easy, it's true. And a few years later, Huckel separated trans decalin and cis decalin by careful fractional distillation. So they did exist. And that's why everybody took to Moore's paper and why they copied out his diagrams. And so he'd written uh, transdecalin with two chairs, he'd written cisdecalin with two boats, I think because that's the way it sits down better on paper, and that's how it was for the next 20 years. Everybody kept copying it down and saying that's what it is. Next 30 years, in fact. Now, Hermans and Boerzikin were some Dutch chemists who worked on the complexes of alpha dials with boric acid, and that was early conformational analysis, but it didn't catch on. 1929 saw the great carbohydrate chemist, W.N. Haworth, writing a book about sugars, and he said, well, sugars are going to have a conformation. I don't know which one it will be, but they're either going to be chairs or boats, and it's going to be very important. And he was right, <coughs> but it took much longer to find out that they were really chairs. 37 to 38, there was some work by Isbell that I won't go into. And then finally in 1950, uh, Prelog, uh, who I knew well, uh, published a paper on, the, on cyclododecane and its substitution products, and he did early confirmation analysis. Thank you. Now we have a point. Yes, we do. There we are. Prelog. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to talk about the ethane problem. The ethane problem was something that came up in 
the middle 1930s. Kemp and Pitzer, Pitzer was the professor, Kemp was the student. They were working at Berkeley in California and they were measuring entropy and then calculating entropy by statistical mechanics. And try, uh, they should be the same, of course. But when they looked at ethane, they found that the calculated entropy for ethane was different to their measured entropy. It was de different by three kilocounts. And they said that means, therefore, there's some barrier to rotation uh, along the carbon-carbon bond of ethane. And that since there are two extremes as you make the rotation about this single bond, one of them, where the hydrogen atoms are as far away as possible, we will call the staggered form, and the one in which they are close, as close together as possible, we will call that the eclipsed form. And they didn't know which was which, which was more stable. But they knew that if this were more stable, the staggered were more stable, cyclohexane would be a chair, and if the eclipsed were more stable, then this would be a boat. The cyclohexane would be a boat, or it would be flat as von Bayer thought. Now, in 1939, the greatest theoretical chemist of the day was called in to do some calculating. And Eyring, who was still at Princeton at that time, he calculated this, on this problem, and he reached the conclusion that the eclipsed was more stable than the staggered, and he reached the conclusion that cyclohexane was flat. Now, 1939 is exactly the same year that Hassel published that preliminary communication that I showed you earlier on, where the tetrabromide was clearly a, a, a chair. And clearly, Eyring's calculations were completely uh, not in accord with the experimental work of Hassel. So what would you make of that? Well, in 1940, a year later, the situation got even worse because Langseth and, and Back doing Raman spectroscopy on cyclohexane also came out that it had a planar conformation. And they did also Raman spectroscopy on tetrachloroethane, this one, the symmetrical one, and again they concluded that it was eclipsed. So, this was, the, it was this paper that provoked Hassel to write his uh, critical review uh, that I referred to before about his own work and in this critical review, in his critical review, Hassel doesn't make any mention of Eyring's calculations. He doesn't seem to think they were of any importance, just as Eyring didn't make any reference to Hassel's experiments. Um, but he did criticize very strongly Langsus and Back, because they were, too, they were working in Denmark, and there's always some feeling between Norwegians and Danes, so it was, came to a, a nice little uh, head at this point. And then Pitzer comes into the picture again. Pitzer spent the war in the Atomic Energy Authority, working on the Manhattan Pro Project. When he got back to Berkeley, he took up the same technique as before, calculating entropy and measuring entropy. And when he did that with cyclohexane, he got clear evidence that cyclohexane was a chair. So uh, that's where we were at that point in history. So you will see that everybody had been, uh, paying, no, been paying no attention to, uh, to Professor Hassel's work. I expect you are laughing because I've told you that if I'm going to go on beyond this date. That's because, that's because I intend to go to the centenary Nobel, Nobel Prize celebrations. The king has some marvellous claret that he serves on those occasions. And I, I only drank one bottle, I'd want to have a few more. <laughs> now, my article in 1950 Experiencia was only four pages long. It was called The Confirmation of the Steroid Nucleus, and it dealt with steroids and triterpenoids and in, 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 in other things. It was a general article. Now, what about what can I tell you about myself? Well, I went to school for, a, for that period of time. My father, it's important to tell you what, to think about your origins. My father was a carpenter, and my grandfather also was a carpenter. And uh, it was because my father, although he had no formal education really, uh, at least knew how to make money by founding a small business, at least because of that I could go to a good private school. So I had a good private education, 
and I naturally took to doing intellectual things like uh, reading books, heavy books about philosophy. Uh, well, in 35, my father suddenly died, and I had to leave school. So I went into the family business, which was in wood, and I worked for two years doing manual work mostly, some office work, and I convinced myself that this was a terrible way to live. It was, <laughs> it was boring and it was repetitive. And those of us who are privileged to have a university education should realize what a privilege it is to know that there's something in life which is better than repeated manual labor. So I made up my own mind that I was going to go to the university. So I took one year off and went to the local technical college and I passed all the examinations which allowed me to enter the university and I got into Imperial College, London, uh, into the second year, so I only had to spend two years before getting my BSc degree. Now, why Imperial College London? It's part of the University of London. And the question was, which college would I go to? There were about 12 of them that offered chemistry at that time. So I got the catalogues of all of them, and I looked through them, and I discovered that the fees were 50% more expensive at Imperial College than they were anywhere else, in particularly, in particularly University College. So I said, that must be 50% better. And that's, <laughs> and that's where I went, and I was entirely justified. It was 100% better. So, during the wartime years, everything happened rather quickly, and one had to do one's PhD on work of national importance. So I, in fact, worked on the synthesis of vinyl chloride, mostly by the pyrolysis of ethylene dichloride. That was a very interesting uh, subject, in fact, fact, because the mechanism was a radical chain mechanism, uh, as long as you got rid of an inhibitor and knew how to add an initiator. So that was quite a well worthwhile intellectual problem. When I finished that, I went into military intelligence, which had a laboratory also at Imperial College. I was two years in that business. I was working on the invention of secret inks to write our paper so that you couldn't read it. And then, as the war came to an end, we didn't need any more military intelligence, so I turned myself into an industrial chemist and went to work for a year on organophosphorus chemistry. But again, I found that rather, rather repetitive. And also, I couldn't choose what problem I was going to work on. That was imposed upon me. So I decided to go back to Imperial College. Uh, I tried to go elsewhere, but nobody would have me. The only, only place I could get a job was in the inorganic chemistry department. And my job was a demonstrator of practical inorganic chemistry to mechanical engineers. And there is no lower position that you can have in the university. That's the lowest possible position from which you can start. So I really did start from the bottom. And, that's, and there's a little advice to you there. If you want to have an academic career, don't be too choosy about the job you get offered. You can always shine if you really work hard and have talent. So, after I'd been teaching uh, uh, inorganic chemistry for a year, doing the lectures of the professor finally, I was promoted to physical chemistry and I taught gas phase kinetics for three years and I taught practical physical chemistry at the same time. So I had quite a background in physics, physical chemistry and even in chemical physics because I used to read the Journal of Chemical Physics at that time. So I knew all about the work of Pitzer and I started to learn about the work of Hassel as soon as he published his paper in Nature. In 1949, I received a telephone call from Professor Fieser at Harvard asking me to come and teach natural product chemistry in place of R.B. Woodward, who was on sabbatical leave. Now, you'll think that's rather a foolish thing of Harvard to do, because here they are inviting a young man to come and teach a course, a graduate student course, on a subject which he has never taught before, since I'd only taught inorganic and physical chemistry before. So you can see that Harvard was somewhat uh, optimistic. 
But it was during that year at Harvard that I wrote this four-page paper, which eventually produced a share in the Nobel Prize. In 1950, while I was still at Harvard, I got an appointment at Birkbeck College in the University of London. That is a night school. It teaches only in the night from between six and nine, and the rest of the day you're free to work hard at your research. So it's really an ideal situation for a young man who wants to do research. It's not an ideal situation for his wife, who um, has to be placated. Uh, at that time, a television set was a sufficient. <laughs> and then, in 55, I went to the University of Glasgow as Regis Professor, and I enjoyed that part of my life because they were very generous to me. But the Professor of Organic Chemistry at Imperial College committed suicide, and they invited me back. <laughs> now, you may ask, what does that mean when the professor of chemistry commits suicide? It means that you have to be a very tough character to survive at Imperial College. It was easy, easy in Glasgow, everybody was friendly, but at Imperial College everybody is trying to cut everybody's throat all the time. But I survived 21 years at Imperial College as professor, and then I did something which was either uh, very daring or very foolhardy. I went to France and became director of the Institute of Natural Products Chemistry. And I was there for seven years, as you will see. I would have been a little longer if they hadn't changed the age of retirement from 70 to 65 suddenly. Uh, and so I'm very happy and glad to say that uh, Texas A&M University doesn't have the same uh, ideas about retirement, and I've been there now since 1986, happily uh, doing my research. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to tell you about my, that's sort of just what happened, where I was. You see I'm quite flexible in my movements, and now I'm going to tell you about my work. My first publication was in the Biochemical Journal in 1943. Uh, it was done with a, a student of physical chemistry called Alexander, and I did the organic chemistry, which was, uh, in fact, most of the work. Um, Alexander had noticed when, when beetles of the Tribolium family died, they made a halo if they were being killed by an inert dust insect, insecticide. Inert dust kills, some inert dust kill insects, and when these insects died, they produced a halo. So they were clearly excreting something. So I grew them. They're easy to grow. You just take a, a, a vase or something like that and put, fill it with, with uh, flour. They live on the flour. They turn it pink because of the quinone that they excrete. And when they've eaten enough, they try to escape, and so if you put a piece of paper on top of the flower, all the beetles climb up and sit on the paper, and in that way you can collect them. They collect themselves for you. So I collected 5,000 of these beetles, uh, it took some time, and uh, when I passed air over them and warmed them gently in a flask, they produced an excretion which I was able to show was ethylquinone, with some methylquinone, a minor amount of methylquinone, polyquinone. And that was the first time that anyone had produced, had identified a volatile substance from an insect, as far as I know. Anyway, it was such an original piece of work that the editor of the Biochemical Journal thought it was a hoax and didn't wish to publish it for some time till I could convince him that we really had done this piece of work. I don't tell it to you because of the scientific aspect, but because it shows uh, something that young people must have if they wish to have an academic career. I did all this work in my spare time. When I wasn't working for military intelligence, I was growing flower beetles and trying to find out what they produced. And so I used to work in the evenings from five o'clock until mid, five or six o'clock till midnight, and I used to work on Saturdays and Sundays. And if you wish to have a successful career, academic career, in chemistry, you have to be prepared to sacrifice your spare time for your research. At least that's what I've always found to be the case. Now, I must explain why I did know something about natural products chemistry in spite of having spent all my time doing physical and inorganic chemistry. <clears throat> 
I knew about I knew about <clears throat> natural products chemistry because I'd always been attracted by it when I was an undergraduate and because I was been developing a method which I call the method of molecular rotation differences. And it was a way of correlating uh, molecular rotations and structures. And if you read the let literature carefully and critically, you could find a number of mistakes in the literature where the wrong structures had been proposed. And that <clears throat> I found to be a very interesting. And in doing that, I learned a lot about steroids and triterpenoids and other molecules. I published a number of papers on that and the theoretical predictions, and eventually we did a lot of practical work as well. Um, <clears throat> now, in 1948, I published a paper on the first force field calculations in conformational analysis. Uh, this was inspired by uh, a paper, Hassel's paper in the first place, and secondly by uh, some calculations by Hughes and Ingo. And so it was very, very difficult to do at that time because you had to do lots and lots of three-dimensional trigonometry and calculations with a slide rule. Uh, but I got through it all right. And finally, I, I confirmed that ethane, the staggered form of ethane, should be more stable than the eclipse, that cyclohexane was a chair, and that both decalins should be two chairs. So I agreed, my calculations agreed with what had been published by Hassel. And finally, in this 1950 paper, which I referred to before, I said this is the preferred conformation of a steroid, of a trans-AB steroid, and this is the planar formula. That, that's what it looks like. It's a planar form, which was already known, and this is what it is in three dimensions, and if you know that, you can predict a great deal about the chemistry of the steroid, about the stereochemical results, stereochemical course of reaction. <clears throat> now, Arthur Birch wrote an annual report a year later, and immediately the field took off. As soon as this paper appeared, or as soon as I talked about it, then everybody started to do confirmation analysis, because it was so easy to do once you made the right assumption and then looked at the thing in the right way. I was just very lucky to be there first. Uh, So this is what Arthur Birch wrote a year later. Confirmational analysis for the study of the stability and reactivity of saturated or partly saturated cyclic systems promises to have the same degree of importance as the use of resonance in aromatic systems. This is perfectly true. And confirmational analysis has every decade has followed with confirmational analysis and of course the molecular biologists and the biochemists and the enzymologists have taken it up. It has become a key way of analyzing all phenomena. Now what did I do when I went back? Uh, when I went back to Birkbeck I gave up uh, measuring things mostly and tried to do uh, more organic chemistry, in particular determination of the stereochemistry of the pentacyclic triterpenoids. And I'm not going to take, not going to go into this in detail because there are not very many chemists here. But what we were able to do was to choose one, uh, one configuration, and hence confirmation, out of 128, say. That's the sort of thing one could do using confirmational analysis, or one out of 256 for this one, which is the dihydro derivative. And then when and X-ray crystallography showed us finally that we were right, and the same thing happened with an osterol. As soon as the structure was determined, we could predict what the configurations were by confirmational analysis. And lanosterol was tackled as a purely intellectual problem, because it was interesting. It turned out, however, to be a very important compound because this is the, a key intermediate in the biosynthesis of steroids and in the biosynthesis of all the steroidal hormones uh, which, on which we depend. And on the next slide, you will see cycloartenol. This I took up as a, as a challenge because I was convinced that the first formula proposed for it must be wrong. I reached that conclusion on the base of, basis of molecular rotation correlations, and I was quite right. 
Uh, the original proposal was entirely different. This is the real formula of cycloartenol, and strangely enough, this turns out to be the key substance in the biosynthesis of steroids in plants. So in, in just a few years, we worked on the key substance in mammals and the key substance in plants, but in neither case did we do it for biochemical reasons. And then in 1957, I took up an interesting problem in, in, in uh, <coughs> conformational analysis. If you brominate this compound, you should get two dibromides. One of them will be alpha, like that, and one will be beta, like that. And in theory, this one will have an equ equatorial carbon bromine bond, and this will have an axial carbon bromine bond. In fact, <coughs> this is the more stable, this is the less stable. You can equilibrate them and prove that. In fact, what we found out was that both of them have an equatorial carbon bromine bond, whereas this one should have been axial. So what does that mean? That seemed to me to mean that we had for the first time met a cyclohexane ring which was in fact said to be in a boat. Now you can understand that if you look at this is the equatorial one, the stable one, and that's got its bromine nicely there, but you see the one three diaxial interaction across the top there. If you put the bromine in the axial position here, pointing upwards, then you've got two one three diaxial interactions. And clearly that's going to be highly destabilized conformation. And so the conformation just turns itself over and changes itself into a boat. Now, how do we learn to what this really was? We simply reduced it with borohydride and we got this compound. And we were able to prove by conformational analysis and by appropriate studies on rates of reactions with model compounds that this was indeed the right stereochemistry. I won't go into details, but that's what happened. And this problem is rather amusing. The first example where, we, where a molecule had the choice of being a chair and boat and chose to be a boat. And it excited everybody, and people have been looking at this, this phenomenon ever since. There's still uh, someone in Japan called Suda who tackles this problem with every kind of physical method. Now with NMR, of course, you, could, you have a beautiful technique for thoroughly analyzing this sort of conformational problem. But when, it, when we did it first, we had only chemistry. <clears throat> now, I'm going, this is the next thing I did in conformational analysis. Since we're mostly not chemists, I'm not going to go into this today. I'm going to show you now the pleasure part of this talk. That is to say, the personalities involved. And the principal personality, apart from myself, is, of course, Professor Hassel. Here is Professor Hassel in the later years of his life. And you will notice something strange about him if you look at, look at him. He was an albino. That is to say, he had no pigment in his skin. And uh, being an albino doesn't affect you mentally in any way, but it means you can't go out in the sunshine and you have to be careful. And it also, in his case, made him into a recluse. He was a very quiet man who did little traveling, and of course in 1930s and 40s travel wasn't as easy as it is now. You didn't go across the world in, in 12 hours. He, he, you had, you took, some, took a week or so about it. And so he didn't mix very much with anybody. Um, <clears throat> if he had mixed more, of course, he would have written the paper that I wrote, uh, or he and his organic colleague would have written that paper. But he didn't. He just kept in one corner, and he never seems to have protested that Irene got all the calculations right, got all the calculations wrong, and he got the right <laughs> structure uh, in his 1939 paper. He never seems to have worried about that. He was unlucky. He was, a, he was an unlucky man because he, his physical measurements were excellent, always. He was always right, nearly always completely right. And yet, nobody paid much attention to him. And it was only after 1950 that some, suddenly people began to realize what he had done. And here's myself, age 31, in 1950, just after I'd written that, uh, that paper. I look as rather pleased about something. <laughs> and here is the late Professor Woodward. R.B. Woodward. I had a long relationship with R.B. Woodward, both professionally and very much personally. And 
he was a constant in, throughout his life. He always wore a blue tie. I never saw him without a blue tie. I never saw him without a blue, dark blue jacket either. I never saw him that he wasn't smoking, though when he went to sleep he must have stopped. And I never saw him also without a ro red rose every day. And he also insisted on, of course, when he wasn't working, he was drinking. And he did that very well too, as everybody remembers. I suppose it was inevitable that he should die young. And here's the two of us in 1955 at a meeting in, Z in Zurich in Switzerland. And that was an interesting meeting. There were four people, there were five people there. There was myself, Woodward, uh, there was Todd, Calvin, uh, and Prelog. And all five of those people got Nobel Prizes later on. So the Swiss must have chosen the right speakers. <laughs> now, this is the story about how I came to write that four-page paper. I had thought that what I was saying to everybody was pretty well obvious. And I wasn't going to write it down in any paper, really, except that when Louis Fieser gave a seminar at Harvard, he got up and he started to say things about steroids that I was sure was quite wrong and that I could explain much better with my ideas of confirmational analysis. So when he finished giving his talk, I got up and gave my little explanation of, of the subject. And he was a senior professor, I was nothing. I think it says a lot for him that he didn't try to squash me or anything. He just said, that's very interesting. Why don't you write it up and we'll send it to Experiencia at the same time. So we did. And that's how my article appeared. It's next door to his article, but nobody's heard of his article because it was wrong. And my article, like good fortune, was right. And so there I, I just read my account of, I, I, thought, I said I thought a little more about it and wrote the paper. So that's exactly what I did. And here's some, some advice for young people. Um, just working hard does not accomplish anything necessarily in science. It is the minimum qualification. So if you don't work hard, you won't get anywhere, but even if you work very hard, it's no guarantee. On top of that, you have to have intelligence and motivation. And then on top of that, you have to have a certain critical spirit, which leads ultimately to intuition. And although I don't consider myself to be a great intellectual, I do think I have some measure of intuition. Many of the things I have done have involved not chains of logic, but reasoning, where there was a gap in the chain of reasoning. And I have been able to jump that gap. Ah, here's something that... Um, I said once at the Bergenstock in 1980, remember, that's 12 years ago now. So I can repeat it. It's, it's easy to be young and brilliant, but not so easy as to be very old and brilliant. <laughs> now, I'm, this, this is from my French period. Um, the, the institute in France was in the grounds of a chateau. It was one of a number of institutes, 18 of them. And so we could use the chateau for our guests and for social occasions. It was very nice. That's the outside in summer. Here's a picture of the gardens with some roses, with some tulips. And here it is in the, in the fall. And here is the institute. Now, this was an institute for... 200 people or so, and my office was put there in that hole. You see there's a hole in the top? That became eventually my office. I've never had a larger office in my life. It was enormous. And the point of that was to impress everybody. Uh, I didn't, in fact, although I was the director, I didn't have any power to direct. So I had to have the illusion of power. And that's the way you get the illusion of power, by having a very large office. And here we come to the story of the stamps. I think this is a nice story. The French put out a, a very nice stamp for Victor Grignard, uh, but he was already dead. Uh, you see it was in the, that, that's his lifetime. That, that's when he died. Uh, and this one is my stamp. Now, my stamp is much more difficult to find out where I am, 
Yeah. I'm in small, very small print on the side there. But at least I'm still alive, so that's something. <laughs> and this, of course, is Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. That's not me, that's the Queen. <laughs> and this is a steroid confirmation. Happily, they got it right, finally. And it's associated with medicine, associated with steroids and medicine in general. And this is one of four stamps which were issued at, on certain, ce uh, certain celebrations of the uh, chem chemical society. And I think it's very nice that finally we put some chemists on stamps. There are not too many stamps for chemists. And this is interesting. This is about a prize that the British give every year. It's called the Cordae Morgan Medal and Prize, and it's given to the chemist who has done the best work <coughs> in, in, in chemistry under the age of 36. So you have to be pretty busy, uh, young, if you're going to be a candidate for this prize. Now, of course, the first one was won by someone whose name you now know, up there, 49. <laughs> but what about the rest of them? Well, they started down here, they started to make, a, make, it, make it two a year, and then it got to be three a year, so it's been organic, inorganic, and physical for, since this time. Now, in the last uh, 29 years, uh, nine of my former students have gained this prize. We start off with Ian Scott, and it's Frank McCapra, Gordon Kirby, uh, Jack Baldwin, the famous and infamous Baldwin, Peter Sams, Magnus, who's now at Austin, Welsh professor at the University of Texas, uh, S.V. Lay, who's now a head of department at Imperial College, William Motherwell, who's just won another prize, and Steve Davies, who is at Oxford. So, what's remarkable about that, then? Well, what's remarkable is that there are roughly 50 professors of organic chemistry in the UK, and therefore your statistical chance of getting a prize, getting a prize for your pupil at any time is 0.5 per annum. So in the course of 29 years, I could have had 0.5, but in fact, I got nine. And so this proves to me, I'm very proud of this, this is something you could be proud about this, because it proves that you did something to these young men, they're all young men, uh, made them do something, made them develop their careers quite quickly. Uh, so that's why I like to show this slide. This is my favorite slide. And finally, now we cross the Atlantic and we're at Texas A&M. Lots of people don't know very much about Texas A&M. It is a large university, as big as the University of Austin, at University of Texas at Austin. We have 44,000 students. We have 100 square miles of campus. Uh, <clears throat> we have buildings which I like to describe as Egyptian because they're put up and so solidly that nobody's ever going to tear them down. <laughs> and this is the new chemistry building. This is the most important building on the campus. Of course, this is where I am. I'm, it's a building without windows, but I'm lucky enough to be on the other side, and I've got some windows in my office, that is, not in my labs. And this is the second most important building on campus after the chemistry. <laughs> And you know what that is. And this is where we're going to put the new chemistry building, the new new chemistry building, all in here. You see there's lots of room for it with 100 square miles. And now when I first went to Texas A&M, they asked me to give the talk that you've been listening to today before 500 or 1,000 1, school teachers I had to give this talk. And in fact, they seem to have appreciated very much my talk because you'll see how they reacted to it on the next slide. See, you can see how enthusiastic they are. <laughs> and now, Texas is, is not a wilderness. Texas is not a dry place. Texas is a beautiful place, and it has lovely flowers in the springtime. They're called blue bonnets. It's a state flower. And it, you get fields of blue bonnets. I've never seen anything so beautiful in my life as the springtime there. And here's lots of them, you see, there they are. And here are a lot more. This is exactly how they grow. The whole field gets covered with these, they're, they're a lupin, they're a small dwarf uh, lupin. Now, these things, 
you would think you'd like to have them in your garden. But I can assure you, we have brought many packets of seed of this thing and even taken them from the wild and illegally transplanted them in the garden. But we've never managed to produce a single one. They don't like gardens. They only like the wild, where they can, I suppose, feel free. And here are these some Indian paintbrushes. The Indian paintbrushes are more common in the United States. They're in other states as well. And here are some paintbrushes in the front and blue bonnets everywhere. And here are some blue, more blue bonnets. I'm sorry, they're paintbrushes. And here's a mixed bag, everything. And finally, here's an orchid. Now, what's this orchid doing there? When you grow orchids, you can create them rather easily, new ones, new species. And so, uh, you can call them by any name you like. Uh, just like you can call roses by any name you like, if they're new ones. So this is my orchid. This is called Mr. Barton's orchid, that one. And the next one, which is even more beautiful, that's my wife, transformed into an orchid. <laughs> So I thank you for your patience in listening to me for just uh, slightly over an hour, and I hope that you enjoyed my talk and that you taught you something. Although we still have a ways to go before we reach our dream of the community of scholars and scientists that I discussed and mentioned earlier, today you have brought us closer to that dream, Sir Derek, and we thank you for sharing with us your own dreams and achievements. Agradecemos profundamente la presencia de Sir Derek, el haber compartido con nosotros algo de su rigurosa y ardua disciplina, algo de su búsqueda y de sus hallazgos. Le agradecemos la presencia de todos ustedes. En vista de que Sir Derek disfrutó tanto el coro, quisiera entonces pedirle que nos acompañaran nuevamente a la salida mientras abandonamos la sala.